as we continue our study on Christ's church. Testing one, two. All right, we're good. All right, having continuing our study on what Christ desires his church to look like. This morning we'll be examining Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11, the church at Smyrna. If we remember from last week, we looked at the church at Ephesus. The church at Ephesus, Christ gave them many commendations. Uh, they were faithful. They had tested those who called themselves apostles. They were patient, enduring, waiting for Christ's return. But at the same time, even though they had a lot of good things going for them, there was the stinging indictment that they had left, abandoned their first love. And Christ warns them strongly, return to that love or your candlestick will be removed. Your light in the world will be gone. As we look at the church at Smyrna this morning, we're going to follow the same general outline, looking at the church, the picture of Christ, Christ's commendation, his condemnation, his counsel, and then his challenge. Let's read together this morning. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Father, we ask again your blessing on our time this morning as we look at this church in Smyrna, a church that, despite difficulties, was faithful to you. I ask that you would give us again minds to listen and ears to hear what you have for us this morning. We ask this in the name of your Son, our Savior. Amen. The church at Smyrna. The name Smyrna comes from the word myrrh, a sweet-smelling perfume that would be used in the embalming of dead bodies. The city of Smyrna was a center of learning and culture. It was proud of its standing as a city. It was outstandingly beautiful, and it claimed for itself to be the glory of Asia. Now, we think Asia today, we're thinking India, China, Russia, Japan. That's not what we're talking. Modern-day Turkey is where the city of Smyrna was at. It was a learning center, a cultural center. It was a very rich city. All of the trade of the valley flowed into its markets and then found an outlet through its harbor, like Ephesus, the city, it was a city of wealth and commercial greatness. But it was also a city deeply committed to idolatry and the worship of the Roman emperor. There was one street in Smyrna called the Golden Street. Called this because on this street you had five different temples to different Roman gods all of them coated with the gold. In 196 B.C., Smyrna built the first temple to Dia Roma, the goddess 
of the city of Rome, a spiritual symbol of the Roman Empire. One commentator said once the spirit of Rome was worshipped, it wasn't much of a step to worship the dead emperors of Rome. Another small step to worship the living emperors and then to demand such worship as an evidence of political allegiance and civic pride. And I read through that and my mind immediately went to this location. I didn't like hearing what my mind was saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. Once the spirit of America is worshipped, it's not such a small step to then put on the pedestals those who were influential in founding this country and holding them up. We haven't hit this point yet, but another, well, I shouldn't say that. There was definitely some Trump worship going on these last four years. Unwilling to see the bad because, hey, he's a Republican. We like that. This was Smyrna. In 23 AD, Smyrna won the privilege over 11 other cities to build the first temple to worship Emperor Tiberius Caesar. Smyrna, as the city, was the leading city in the Roman cult of emperor worship. The Roman emperor Domitian, in 81 to 96 AD, about the time John is writing this letter, was the first to demand worship under the title Lord from the people of the Roman Empire as a test of political loyalty. Why is that such a big deal? Because as a Christian, Christ is Lord. And yet the Roman Empire was demanding his subjects to say, I am Lord. Same word for deity. Emperor worship had begun as a spontaneous demonstration of gratitude to Rome, but toward the end of the first century in the days of Domitian, the final step was taken and Caesar worship became compulsory. Once a year, the Roman citizen was called to burn a pinch of incense on the altar to the godhead of Caesar, and having done so, he was then given a certificate to guarantee that he had performed his religious duty. All that a Christian had to do would just be burn a pinch of incense and say the word Caesar is Lord to receive their certificate, go away, and then they could worship Christ as they pleased. But that is precisely what the church at Smyrna and other Christians would not do. They would give no man the name of Lord but instead reserve that title for Christ in Christ alone. The picture of Christ that we see to this church, he says the words of the first and the last, going back to chapter 1, the one who died and came to life, the first and the last, choosing this title from his initial appearance, speaking of his eternal character. The first and last are titles that belong only to Yahweh. Isaiah 44, verse 6, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. Caesar is not Lord. In Isaiah 48, 12, Listen to me, O Jacob, in Israel, whom I called I am he, I am the first, and I am the last. In his call to the church at Smyrna, he's reminding them of his eternality. He's reminding them of the fact that he is God. But he also tells them that he is the one who died and came to life. A reminder that we serve a risen Lord victorious over death. Death could not hold our Savior, and death will not hold his people. Christ's association with death 
and ultimate victory of his resurrection is throughout this short three-verse letter to the church at Smyrna. I was dead, but I am now alive. And because of this, he deserves by all considerations of reverence our gratitude, our love, and most importantly, our obedience. This is an assurance to the pastor of the church as well as the members of the church against the fear of death. Why do they need to worry about that? Well, let's look at the commendation that Christ gives them. He says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And I know the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Christ tells them he knows their tribulation. He knows the persecution that they underwent, even to the spoiling of their goods. 2 Timothy 3.12, Paul tells us, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So often we look for religious freedom to give us the ability to worship God. We don't need religious freedom to worship God. In fact, if you look through the centuries of church history, where did the church grow? In areas where there was no religious freedom. In fact, in areas where Christians could not hold office or have public sway. That's when you have in the book of Acts the cry called, brought against Christians, these men who have turned the world upside down. Why? Because they were accepted by the government? No. Because they preached Christ. They worshiped regardless of the consequences. Christ says, I know your tribulation. What comfort it is that Jesus takes notice of their troubles and ours as well. Christ also tells them that I know your poverty. Historically, the city of Smyrna was prosperous, and yet the Christians were poor. The city of Smyrna was not only a wealthy trade city, but it was also a city of guilds or unions today, which would regulate the craftsmen of the day. Because Christian tradesmen could not confess Caesar as Lord, their shops would be boycotted. Their employment would be terminated. They would receive their raids on their house to remove what they did have. But that didn't deter them from serving God. The Christians at Smyrna knew poverty, and it wasn't just that they could get onto some government program barely crossing a line. They had nothing. And yet they, as the author of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 10.34, they joyfully accepted the plundering of their property because they knew that you, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. They recognize, you know, if I lose everything here, and many of them did even to the point of losing their life, but they recognized what's coming after is worth a whole lot more than what I'm going through now. This is not to say that there's anything wrong with having money. The trouble is that money so easily has us. Christ says in Mark 10, 23, Jesus looked to his disciples and says, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. You know, this is not as modern social justice would like us to think rich people are bad theology. That's not what Christ is saying. But what he's saying is people who have means to provide for themselves don't realize the need that they actually have. And it's difficult to get them to that place. It's easier for a camel to fit through the eye of a needle, Christ says, than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus says, I know that you're poor, but you're rich. Physically speaking, they had nothing. Despite the financial loss, Christ encourages the church at Smyrna in the reality that they are rich. Rich. 
not in the world's goods, but in a more important respect, in the grace and in the favor of God. Paul writes to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. We are treated as impostors, and yet we are true. We are treated as unknown, and yet we are well-known. As dying, and behold, we live. As punished, and yet we are not killed. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. We are treated as if we're poor, yet we make many rich. We're treated as if we have nothing, but in reality, we possess everything. Why? Because the money that so often we spend our time chasing after on this earth means nothing compared to an eternity with Christ. So while we may have nothing, and the church at Smyrna had nothing, they had what counted. Christ tells them also, I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not. He knows their vilification. Those who claim that they are Jews, which by the way, they were Jews, still believing themselves to be God's own people, and yet because of their rejection of Christ, God has put them aside. As Paul tells us in Romans 2, a Jew is one inwardly. Circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. The Jews allied themselves with the other pagans in putting Christians to death in an attempt to stamp out Christianity. They were Jews outwardly. They had the external signs, but inwardly they were not. In fact, Christ says they are of the synagogue of Satan. In John 8, 44, talking to the scribes and Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil. Your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of it. Christ tells the church at Smyrna, I know the slander that is being put out against your name. With their rejection of the Messiah, Judaism became as much a tool of Satan as the emperor worship of Smyrna. But this indictment that Christ has against the Jews is a temporary one. Keep reading through the book of Revelation. Read through the book of Romans. God is not done with Israel yet. He's coming back to them. This indictment that they are the synagogue of Satan applies to any church that preaches a gospel other than the gospel of Christ. And unfortunately, there are many buildings today in this country with the name church on the door that are truly synagogues of Satan because they do not preach the gospel. Christ says, I know what you're going through and you can take comfort in that the condemnation perhaps the greatest of commendations that christ has for this church was the fact that there is no condemnation the ephesus you guys abandoned me is what he said the church at smyrna it's not a perfect church how do we know that there were people involved it wasn't perfect but they were doing their best to serve God and remain true to him. No condemnation. What counsel does he give? We would like to think that the counsel Christ gives this church, this church that has remained faithful to him in spite of persecution, in spite of poverty, in spite of vilification, is that there is an end in sight that Christ is about to tell the church at Smyrna, your sufferings are drawing to an end. Your night of weeping is going by and the morning of joy is about to dawn. But this is not what Christ says. He says, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Wait a second, Christ, that doesn't make sense. They've already been suffering. They've already proved themselves faithful to you. Why are they going to suffer more he says do not fear 
what you are about to suffer. He does not promise an exemption from suffering. But rather, Christ knows that they are going to suffer. Rather than promising deliverance, he entreats them and he commands them to not be afraid. Literally, stop being afraid of the persecution. Oftentimes, when we read through church history and we see these martyrs of the faith, people who died for Christ, people who took a stand, we think, man, these guys are like superheroes in their faith. The church at Smyrna, its most famous pastor was a gentleman by the name of Polycarp. I'll let you do your own research on him after the service is done. But martyred for his faith. Wonderful story of dedication to Christ. And yet Christ is telling this church, stop being afraid. They weren't superhuman They didn't have some magical aspect of the Holy Spirit that caused them to not be afraid of the bad things happening around them. They were fearful. Christ says, stop. He says, don't fear. The suffering is specified. He tells them, the devil, our adversary, is about to throw some of you into prison. This is not a reformed prison. Oftentimes, these prison sentences here, you would be in prison as you then await your execution. The purpose of the suffering is that they are to be tested. He said, you are going to be tested so that the reality of your faith will be able to see if it's genuine. The design in this case is the Savior's testing their faith although he allows Satan to be the one to administer it. Divine trials, testings versus temptations are the same from God's perspective. Our faith is tested and proved when we respond appropriately to the trial. But when we seek to solve the trials outside of what God's will is, they become temptations that we fall into. As we learned from the book of Job, God in his sovereignty allows Satan to be able to attack his people for their testing. And we may not even know why. This was an opportunity for the church at Smyrna to demonstrate the reality of their faith in the face of persecution. The suffering that's coming will be limited. Jesus says you will be thrown into prison And for 10 days you will have tribulation. Now as you read commentaries, some commentators will assert that these 10 days are prophetic days, representing years. So the church at Smyrna, you're going to go through 10 years of difficult persecution. And incidentally, the persecution suffered under Diocletian the Roman Empire emperor, which was the worst of the persecutors, lasted 10 years. But we can take numbers and make them say anything in the scriptures. We've discussed that. Other commentators will assert that these 10 days are referring to 10 persecutions of the church. And ironically, if you go from Nero to Diocletian, you have 10 emperors who persecuted the church. Others will assert that this is just a common Greek figure of speech. You're going to suffer for a short time. Grammatically, okay, if we take this, and we do, to be a literal letter written to a literal church in the literal city of Smyrna, why would we not take 10 days as being a literal 10 days? But pastor, Jesus couldn't have prophesied that. That's too specific. We can talk after class if you'd like to discuss that. What is Jesus saying? Take rest in your tribulations. Don't be fearful because I do not only know what is going to happen, but I know how long it's going to happen, and I am over it. 
I am in control. And just as the church at Smyrna was able to take comfort in knowing that the suffering would not be outside of what Christ allows. You know, when we go through suffering, recognizing, as we saw in 1 Peter, suffering sometimes comes because Christ allows it to come. But we can also take comfort in knowing that Christ is completely in control of what is going to happen in our lives. And if that means this nation continues its course, goes downhill, finishes turning its back on God, and we are persecuted, Christ knows. And our responsibility is not to get the government back where it needs to be. Our responsibility is to focus on the truth of God's word and reaching our neighbors, reaching those that we can influence with the gospel. That's what the early church did, and it worked pretty well for them. In Romans 8, 18, Paul says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Paul understood suffering, went through it a few times. Shipwrecked, beaten, stoned, left for dead oftentimes naked, oftentimes without food, oftentimes without water, imprisoned unjustly. And Paul says, you look at all my affliction, I will gladly suffer because of what's coming. And Christ tells them, remain faithful until death. He doesn't tell them to be faithful only through the difficulties, but he extends their faithfulness to him until their death. Although the affliction would be brief, it might be fatal to some. There were those in the original audience who were about to die. And Christ tells them, remain faithful until the hour of death. The command and promise are equal in application also to those who did not perish. In whatever manner a Christian is to die, Christ tells us, if that individual is faithful unto death, The crown of life awaits. Literally, the crown that is life or the reward of life eternally. This is not a crown that would have been worn by royalty, but rather an allusion to the wreaths that were awarded to athletes who won their competitions. The implication being that only those who remain faithful to Christ are truly born again. What challenge does Christ give? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. As we saw last week to the church at Ephesus, Christ's challenge to them begins with hearing. He who has an ear to hear implies Again, that there are those in the original audience without ears. In other words, those within the church of Smyrna who do not have the ability to hear the Spirit because they are not born of the Spirit. But those who are saved, here's the challenge that Christ gives. The test of whether one hears the Spirit, as we said last week, is found in their obedience to the Spirit. Jesus says the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. And again, we ask the question, if one this promise is given to those who conquer, how do I conquer? Christ challenges us to hear. He challenges them to conquer. As we said last week, everyone who is born of God overcomes, has already conquered the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Who conquers except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This promise is given to all who are saved. Those who are saved, Christ gives the promise that they will not face eternal death in the lake of fire for all eternity. And when you look at a church that's going through persecution, a church that has nothing, 
the greatest promise that they can receive is from Christ. I will give you eternal life. It doesn't matter what's going on now compared to what is coming. Where do our loyalties lie? The Christians in Smyrna had a clear decision to make. If they were going to confess Christ as Lord, it was a death sentence. You know, we take the scriptures, if you confess that Jesus is Lord, you know, all you have to do is say the words and poof, you're saved. Our salvation doesn't depend on what we say. Those in Smyrna, if they were here today and if they saw how easy we made it to try to get people saved, they would laugh. They understood the reality of it. In our previous church, I'll be gentle with this, there was an older woman who understood what it meant to confess Christ. She grew up in a Jewish home. We're talking modern 21st century America. Her life ran into the truth of the gospel. And she made a decision that she was going to confess Christ as Lord. Her family, modern 21st century American, held a funeral for her. She was dead to them. At this point, several decades later, the only reason that she has contact with her mother is because her mother is not doing well. Otherwise, that's what it meant. The early church understood this. Have we truly confessed Christ? I'm not saying have we made, said the words. But is Christ truly in the place of Lord in our lives? Are we being faithful to him? Even during the difficult times? Are we fully resting in his sovereignty when difficult times come? Are we taking comfort in the fact that our trials on this earth are short compared to eternity with Christ? Do we truly have ears to hear? Are we born of the Spirit? Are we saved? If not today, could be that day. To the church at Smyrna, Christ says, don't fear the suffering. If I can put it succinctly, I got you. Are we resting in Christ? Father, we thank you that during the difficulties of our life, suffering that we go through, which pales in comparison to the suffering that the church at Smyrna demonstrated, and their faithfulness to you through it. But God, I ask that you would help us to take our refuge in you. Recognizing that you are in control. Laying claim to the promise that the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. And Father, we do ask for anyone in this room who has not accepted you as Savior. They have not truly confessed you as Lord. That today would be the day of salvation for them. We ask these things in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.